Hello, I'm Pun Wakas, Dean of the Zicklin School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. Our theme is business and society, and today we're talking about the challenges facing corporate America. Joining me from the Dean's office is Gwen Webb, Associate Dean for Executive Education, and Gwen will moderate the Q&A period at the end. We're delighted to have with us today Ingrid Dyson, co-portfolio manager of the core equity and sustainable equity strategies at Newberger Berman. Joining Ingrid in the conversation is Sonali Hazarika, associate professor of finance here in the Zicklin School of Business. And of course, as always, leading our conversation is Larry Zicklin, former chairman of Newberger Berman, an alum and the school's benefactor, and I'm happy to say also a professor in our undergraduate honors program. Larry? Thank you very much, Fenwick, and welcome everybody too. So Ingrid, let me start with you. Uh, what are your responsibilities at Newberger Berman? Hi, Larry. Um, ha happy to be here. Uh, I've been at Newberger for 25 years, and I run our sustainable equity strategy, which is a approximately $5 billion strategy across a mutual fund and separate accounts. And this is investing in largely US um, public equities, mid to large capitalization. And we invest on behalf of high net worth individuals, as well as institutions and are available in many um, 401k plans and, and pension fund um, options. Uh, I also um, have the pleasure of sitting on the firm's proxy committee, and that is uh, a committee that oversees how the firm votes and engages companies on a whole range of issues from governance issues uh, to environmental and social uh, issues that face businesses. I'm, I'm impressed with the fact that you're with the firm 25 years. First Almost of all, you, you don't look old enough to be there 25 years. Almost and at Newburger Berman, if you're there 25 years, you're in the training class because there's so many people there that long. Uh, what about the amount of money you influence at the firm? Because it's more than your portfolio management. I'm, I'm assuming other portfolio managers are talking to you about the things they should be investing. Yeah. Newberger has over 300 billion in, in assets. Uh, again, invested on behalf of a wide range of, of end clients. And we've taken uh, the leadership to say that we fundamentally believe that environmental, social, and governance issues are critical to long-term business success. And I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit uh, more in our discussion, but there's a plethora of information out there, some of it valuable and some of it, quite frankly, useless, um, <laughs> that influence how investors uh, think about ESG. And so we really come from the perspective of long-term shareholder value creation as opposed to uh, social justice issues. That's not to say that social justice and environmental um, issues are not uh, of great public concern, but we come through it as a, an investor, uh, both from a risk perspective and thinking about how do you mitigate risk uh, but increasingly, how do you think about opportunities and how do you find companies and identify companies that may be at a competitive uh, advantage because of their integration of ESG, uh, as well as taking companies who are high quality businesses that really have an opportunity to implement best practices uh, with, the, with the goal of uh, having sustainable businesses and sustainability, meaning not just financial sustainability, but the sustainability um, and the integrity of, of, of their operations. In, Ingrid, is there a universal definition of ESG and sustainability? Do we all agree on what that is? Uh, good news, bad news, depending on your perspective. But I think I, I'd be interested in hear Sonali's remarks, but I, I think the answer is unfortunately no. Um, I, on, there's no universal definition. Um, but on, uh, at the same time, 
I think that there is increasing clarity that issues like climate change are real and can have material business impact. Uh, and so these, these issues, when I first joined Newberger, um, we used to ask uh, companies, did they have an environmental policy statement? Did they um, have any um, pollution prevention pays program on trying to re reduce their um, imp negative externalities, the impact on the environment? Today, fast forward, it's still environmental issues, but the the expectations and the level of sophistications companies can have uh, in terms of having meaningful impact on the environment, both in terms of their physical operations, so their, their plant and their carbon footprint or their environmental footprint. But increasingly, there are lots of opportunities in the capital markets to provide solutions to societal problems. If you can if you can come up with a solution that ger generates earnings and free cash flow and directs, uh, directly impacts um, and helps a societal problem, then that is a fantastic business. The challenge is finding the business that actually can generate earnings and free cash flow from doing so, as opposed to a nonprofit that might be very specific in addressing an environmental issue. So the issues are the same. The definition on what best practices is rapidly evolving. And that is the, um, that's the competition today in the marketplace. On the corporate side, staying ahead of the regulatory curve and trying to um, evolve your business practices to attract talent, retain talents, particularly in today's environment. Um, and then also on environmental issues uh, to not only improve your direct operations, but see other products and services out there that can then solve some of the, the challenges that we face. Is your primary objective to find companies generating earnings, free cash, free cash flow, future, et cetera? Is that yeah. number yeah. one? We, we are investors in high quality businesses. So we're not social activists. Um, we are uh, not non, not for profit leaders. Um, we are really trying to find well positioned businesses, and I think there's there's lots of different approaches to sustainability and ESG investing. Um, the lens that uh, I come from is looking for high quality businesses and taking a long term investment horizon. So we say long term is three to five years. There's been many companies in our portfolio that have been there for for ten years plus, and I think having that uh, that time horizon is critical. Uh, because many of the, you know, climate is measured in uh, centuries. Earnings are measured in, qu in, in quarters. <laughs> and the stock performance is measured in seconds. Uh, and so having, uh, looking at uh, ESG data, it really speaks to trying to find companies that can weather a variety of macro backdrops. And uh, you can't make money in our over the long run, unless you have a business that generates earnings and free cash flow. Now, in today's environment, there's certainly been periods where uh, stock market investors probably could make money by investing in speculative names that don't generate earnings and free cash flow with the hope that someday they will. Uh, but after having been uh, at Newberger for many years, it is um, certainly clear to me that you have to have businesses that generate earnings and free cash flow. Now, with that said, operating practices and the differentiating of differentiation of your products and services in the marketplace um, are what contributes to that. So examining, examining a company, if they're a responsible operator, what are their workplace practices? How do they attract and retain talent? If that next dollar of revenue is coming from intellectual property or developing a new drug or the financial services market, um, information technology, innovation, that, that's predicated on people. So what are you doing to attract and retain and incent the best most diverse uh, group of people um, should be a question you ask to think about the sustainability of that revenue and, and earnings growth over time. Uh, likewise, if you're in the manufacturing uh, sector, 
and you've had a great track record of generating earnings and free cash flow, and it appears that you're a disciplined steward of capital, what are the uh, environmental implications of your business and how do they compare to your competition and also to the changing um, environment around thinking uh, around energy intensity, climate, chemicals used, um, you, you name it. Uh, and so from our perspective, ESG or sustainability is a peeling the onion, so to speak, and looking at um, what are the uh, practices that support the numbers, so to and, speak. And I don't mean to take uh, all our time, Sonali, so just, you have a question, just bust in. Um, okay. But this Thank DEI, you. which you should probably define, and ESG, are you looking at both those criteria in order to make an investment? Is that a question for me? Yeah. So you're saying ESG and, and DEI. Yes. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. So and with every company, we're going to, first of all, we're not going to be interested in company unless we think that it is has the ability to generate earnings and free cash flow. But within the context, we'll take a look at what are the issues that are most impactful from a social and environmental perspective on a particular sector and industry. And so clearly um, equity and inclusion is important across all companies, uh, but would be even uh, more valuable in companies that are intellectually property rich, because that is where human capital is functionally driving that next dollar of revenue. And actually that's where we've seen some of the uh, most um, significant progress. And I know Sonali has done some um, uh, research on uh, looking at executive compensation in, in other areas. So I'll, I'll turn it over to her uh, shortly. But the, the point being is that we're, we're really focusing on what are the issues that face that particular company uh, or in industry. So for example, um, uh, semiconductor manufacturing. If you just look at a data set, you may say, oh, this company looks like they use a lot of energy and a lot of water. And this company looks really green because they use barely any water um, or have minimal energy usage. But if you don't understand, there's a differentiation in business model. One is vertically integrated, owns, owns fab. The other one outsources it. And so it's not reporting on that. That data is meaningless. And so I think one of the things with ESG that's really important is to make sure you understand what drives that sector or that industry and what are the specifics to that company's business model um, that are most relevant uh, to, to, to its, its success. Ingrid, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, right? So um, like you said, that there are different rating agencies and, you know, the metrics to look at ESG is different. Uh, I mean, and there are questions around that. So specifically, um, what, what do you guys look at? So in your company, what kind of ratings are you looking at? Or are you doing your own research or are you looking at a combination? Yeah. The, the benefit of um, ratings is aggregation of data. I mean, it's the same thing that a traditional financial analyst will often go to uh, Bloomberg or FactSet to be able to pull up historical data real quickly to looking at earnings and, and cash flow or different segment, um, as well as you know, various metrics on um, profitability and et cetera. And so ESG data is no different. Um, the good news is that there has been a proliferation of, um, of information out there. And increasingly companies are reporting um, to various um, entities. So CDP is one um, um, data aggregator um, around environmental data. And it's really helpful as an investor because it will look at um, uh, companies and how they compare on a whole host of questions. So data, but then also how they respond to um, more qualitative questions. And so there's easy comparability. There's a number of sustainalytics, MSCI, you name it. There's a, a, a ton of third-party rating and aggregators. And that's a, a very useful starting point. Um, sometimes there's challenges in like any, in any industry, there's challenges with data quality, or are you in the appropriate peer group? I just came from a, a, a meeting talking about ratings in the healthcare sector. 
and some of the uh, med tech companies were coming up at the lower end of uh, third party ratings um, in part because of product recalls. And when you look at um, who's getting the product recalls, a lot of the companies are the companies that put things into somebody's body. So a cardiovascular company was coming up uh, as uh, getting dinged, so to speak, for having product recalls, but they were being compared to, let's say, a contact lens company that doesn't have the same, obviously, scope and severity. And so uh, with, with any data set, uh, there, it's most helpful to use with combined with intelligence and understanding as opposed to uh, making a, a binary decision on any, any one data point. But it, to, the, to, to your point, um, it is the, it's a very useful um, starting point. And I, and I think what, what the research has shown is that even though there's divergence, I mean, we can explain why there is divergence. There's some understanding around that. And, and to your point that we can see it matters. So, you know, when people are comparing different companies on ratings or any changes that a firm has made, for example, uh, I've looked at um, uh, ESG linked pay contracts. So what, what they talk about is um, managers of firms um, if they have explicitly linked executive com uh, compensation contracts explicitly linked to um, some ESG metrics, does that impact ratings? And the answer is yes. So people are looking at these, um, uh, what the managers are doing is because of these explicitly linked ESG metrics, are managers doing something different? And then does that impact rating? So it's, it's, does, it's taken into account. And it, it will be really interesting. I know your, your research had looked at um, companies that um, put some type of ESG ratings. And so an example of that would be if you're a med tech, med tech company, um, executives might get dinged, if you will, if they have um, some product um, liability issue or if they have um, uh, manufacturing, FDA um, manufacturing issues. If you're a, um, uh, another company that has set explicit diversity targets um, in your business, then why not have executives accountable to the same diversity um, uh, targets that, they, that they've that they set. So these are the type of things that companies are just starting to do. And I know you're, I think you, you, you told me that your research um, shows that those companies have better ratings and maybe even yeah. better, better profit margins. Yes. Better profit so, margins. Yeah. And so it would be interesting yeah. to see over time as everybody gets on the bandwagon, if that differentiation holds. Because one of the things that I've observed is that you have to have transparency to have accountability. You have to measure something to be able to, to set goals and targets. And so the companies that are probably more likely to be willing to integrate ESG into executive comp have been more thoughtful and integrated around these topics to begin with, where they have a level of comfort that these are material and meaningful to their business. Um, so much comfort that they're willing to set targets. But I do worry a little bit about uh, the prolifer proliferation of check the box mentality, you know, set targets so it sounds good, you look good, but they might not be uh, meaningful. So that, that, that will be an evolution, I'm sure of. Ingrid, I want to, I want to stop you right there. I want to be a fly on the wall. I want to hear what the conversation is like when you interview a company for possible inclusion in your portfolio. You're satisfied as to the fundamentals, the profitability, the cash flow, uh, but you're interested in the ESG, DEI side of it. Tell me how that conversation looks. What are you asking? What might they be responding? Yeah, so it really depends on who we are speaking to. Uh, most often the initial contact will be with investor relations. And then um, as we become more interested in the company and need further granularity, it will be with the CFO um, and or uh, should we be lucky enough, the, the CEO. And it will highly depend on um, the, the level of um, 
sophistication of that company around these issues. So there are companies like Vestas Wind Systems, a wind turbine manufacturer, um, uh, Aptiv, the um, electrical architecture and infrastructure in, in auto parts um, that are um, highly sophisticated, as you can imagine, on a range of, in that case, environmental um, issues, in part because their business solutions supports directly um, mitigating um, climate change. Vestas being the wind turbine company and Aptiv, um, a key player in the electrification of transportation. And so they have very high uh, sophistication around those issues. And what we really want to do is understand um, measure metrics and what what their goals are and how that is tied back into um, driving uh, the secular opportunity for those businesses. On the other side, there may be a, a distributor um, that their products and services aren't directly um, changing the world as we know it, but these are very critical business functions that help a lot of other businesses um, become uh, efficient and be able to run their business. So they are a kind of a linchpin in the economy to uh, facilitating other businesses. And there, um, the conversations will be quite different um, in terms of thinking about, in the case of uh, diversity and inclusion, and it may be predicated on where they are and what their perspective uh, is. I think um, in the post Floyd, George Floyd environment, there is um, a much greater, I'd call it even an awakening in corporate America that the challenges of diversity and inclusion at all levels in a company um, is actually not just good for society, uh, but is that the corporations have, have, a, have a role to play. Uh, and so we've had um, conversations around what companies are doing to create economic upward mobility. And when we first had that, when we first had a conversation, I, I quite frankly didn't know if it was going to get pushed back that someone views, I thought you were an investor, but you sound like a socialist or something. Um, but the reality is, when you ask the questions, um, we've got surprisingly uh, great responses from companies around things that they're doing to create um, upward opportunity for their employees, um, pushing down equity comp to further align everybody with the success of the business and, and, the, and the shareholder. And so it, um, I, I would say that in, in general, I've been surprised uh, in the past several years, particularly, particularly around um, diversity and inclusion. I remember just a quick little story in my early days um, at Newberger and call, um, we sent out all these letters to the companies in our portfolio around um, women on boards. At the time, I think 15% of women sat on corporate um, boards. Today, it's not much, 25 years later, it's only something like 30% or just shy of or around that. So it's, it hasn't been a grand transformation. Um, and I remember bracing myself um, for the response that um, I, I would get. Um, and some would be, well, we're looking for the most qualified candidate and we don't see any women. And, you know, you want us, if you're, if you're a shareholder that's thinking about the long-term growth of this business, you should be, we should be hiring talent as if, as if uh, suggesting at the time that a woman wouldn't be talent. You, there's none of that today. Um, there's absolutely none of that. And in a, in a labor market, I mean, there's four hire signs everywhere in companies, in your probably local neighborhoods. And if you're thoughtful around trying to attract and retain talent, you better be talking about these. Uh, so I would say the conversation, the conversation uh, really has changed. Right now it's about the rate of change and have you set targets and goals because you can make grand statements. I'm gonna lose 10 pounds in one month. But if you don't have a plan for how you're going to uh, make those changes, you're not going anywhere. And the same thing holds true um, with ESG. Sonali, I don't know if you have 
Um, no, I wanted to ask you a question. Do you, um, and I'll come back to research about it. Do you think there is a difference when the same questions are asked to an American company versus uh, international or a European company? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And it really depends on where you're coming from. Um, Europe and the U Europe is arguably way ahead <laughs> on the topic of uh, climate. Um, and it's not, for some reason in this country, we still have um, a little bit of politics influencing the, the, the climate discussion. It's much, it's almost, it's much less so uh, in Europe where climate is significantly less political and just a, a given. Um, however, you go to Japan um, and you're talking about diversity and inclusion, it's obviously a, a very different uh, discussion or even governance, just basic independence of the, the board of directors. So um, certainly we've seen um, drastic uh, change or positions based on where a company is based. Right. And, you know, research kind of points to that. And, you know, research, uh, academic research uh, has looked at legal origins, for example. So, you know, there's a difference in the common uh, legal origin and a civil legal origin. And the common legal origin is what the United States is uh, and the UK is. And uh, fundamentally, it's more about shareholder capitalism. I mean, it's more oriented towards that, the way the legal origin is written. And a civil legal origin is, is, is tends to be more uh, about private contacting in a social in a social setting. So there's more about stakeholder capitalism in that in the civil legal origins. And what research has shown uh, is civil origin countries, for example, France, Germany, Scandinavia. These are more uh, civil origin countries. You do see more. Um, um, uh, the ratings are higher, or the companies on average have higher social or ESG related activities in those countries. Uh, we see the same uh, in our uh, ESG linked compensation piece. So, and I wanted to bring that back because, so there is the piece about culturally or the way the institutional arrangements are in different parts of the world, which could lead uh, to certain parts of the world being on a lead, uh, you know, maybe more of for leading in these areas versus I think in the United States, and it's not a versus, it's just different ways of doing business. In the United States, it's more about, do uh, is what you said about the long-term orientation. It's doing well by doing good. That's kind of how we have looked at, you know, ESG is important or companies like yours are talking about, you need to do something about it because for the long-term shareholder, uh, you know, you, this is how you're going to get. So, you know, you can have stakeholder capitalism, but yeah. you're going to bring in the, the pieces for other parts of the stakeholders, for example, the communities, the employees, the customers, because that's going to actually benefit the shareholder in the long term. So I think it's just a different way of looking at this. Okay. I, I wonder if I can pursue world. that for a second. I noticed in the paper this morning that France mm -hmm. is going to spend upwards of a billion dollars in nuclear power uh, to restore more nuclear power. And France is basically nuclear powered. If we looked in your portfolios, would we find a nuclear power company? It's funny, we were just having a discussion about this this morning. So um, at the beginning of the new Berger Berman Socially Responsive Fund, which today is called the Sustainable Equity Fund, uh, we had an explicit um, avoidance criteria around nuclear power. And the premise behind that was the connection between power, nuclear power, and the pro proliferation of uh, weapons technology. So think Iran or North Korea. And then there was a second component of it around sort of thinking around the sustainability of nuclear power as it relates to the waste. And, um, really what do you do with the waste today the waste is largely sits on site in our communities um, because uh, there's no place quote safe place approved place to put it and so i think one of the and, and again for the past couple of decades there's been discussion well they'll be they'll be able to figure this out they to my knowledge they haven't figured it out um, and so that 
remains a, a, a big concern. It has gotten an absolute um, uh, step up on the pedestal, if you will, uh, given that it's reliable um, baseload capacity in uh, uh, what is increasingly looks to be a carbon constrained world. And one of the challenges um, with renewables, as you can imagine, is the intermittency. So when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, what, um, what's, the, what's the backup power? And today, um, battery technology is coming a long way, but has it really become the most efficient um, source for, um, for, for, for uh, ensuring that backup power. Uh, and so there's lots of, um, I, that's how nuclear still has, has a bid, so to speak. Because do you have it in your portfolio? We do not. Um, but there's been many, much discussion, is that an appropriate avoidance crit screen when we need, um, when we need uh, power, uh, low carbon uh, power now? And you've heard all of the uh, climatologists and scientists talk about carbon avoided now is a lot more valuable than carbon avoided in the future, just given how um, uh, CO2, how long CO2 stays in the atmosphere, et cetera. So, um, you know, there, there's many different perspectives. We, found, we, we, we find that the great thing about investing is you don't have to own everything. Um, and that as an active manager, you, you, you can pick and choose companies. And so we have an own uh, nuclear power. But there are, just for the record, there are utilities that have nuclear power that are also have large fleets of, of renewable energy. And so if you're interested in owning uh, renewable energy, uh, you may in fact um, have nuclear in, in the mix uh, just because that's the way the world currently is. Would you own a utility that's partially fueled by nuclear power? No. So you're off nuclear power. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Would you and own that, a Would you own yeah. a, a global oil company? No. We have no energy, um, and it really speaks to it's. Uh, you know, our view is that natural gas is a, uh, will be and is currently an important um, transition fuel. Uh, our investor base uh, is highly concerned around the climate impact, um, the long-term climate impact related to trad traditional fossil fuels. And many of those um, E&Ps historically had um, questionable re returns on, on ca invested capital over time. So there's been other ways to have energy exposure. We own a company called National Grid. It's a half UK, half US business. It's transmission of um, electricity and, and, and gas, but largely electricity. And they're part of decarbonizing the economy. They're going to be bringing the interconnectors on to attach to the renewables, to attach to the hydros. And so as you try to decarbonize the grid is the lingo, as you try to reduce and increase the efficiency and the renewable componentry of our distribution system of our electricity. So when you plug your light into the wall or your car into the, um, uh, into the socket uh, that increasingly you'll have renewables and they're, they're part of, uh, a, a part of that, uh, that long-term trend. Ingrid, you work for a profit-making firm, your profit-making segment of that firm. You want to increase the size of the assets under management because that brings in greater fees. That's your business. Mm -hmm. Would you permit me to go into the conversation you have with some state pension fund that's considering investing in your fund what is that conversation like? What are you telling that uh, investment management person, that investor uh, from the state of XYZ about what you're going to do for them in terms of ESG and DEI? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. Um, if you do not have a, um, <clears throat> competitive uh, returns and if you do not have um, a consistent process, your there, there's not a lot of interest. So you have to have um, 
a, a quality portfolio and a consistent process, and you have to have a track record that demonstrates that you're competitive in a variety of, of markets or else there's very little interest. The second um, point is that that's not, that's, that's, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And that increasingly large um, pension funds and institutions are also worried around these long-term secular um, headwinds in many cases uh, that face our economy. And so they want to know that you don't just have a screen or a filter, but that you have a mechanism for evaluating these risks and opportunities, and that you can have a, a way of reporting that out externally. So you know, one of the benefits of Sonali's uh, research is that she has data. And so while we request um, information from, from companies, um, we increasingly are being asked by um, our investors to report out how this data looks like on the portfolio. So looking at uh, how the diversity and inclusion, whether it's um, women or people of color on boards of directors, on those that have PL responsibility, those, uh, what type of programs on either diversity and supply chains, 100 best companies to work for, sort of externally validated um, markers for being a diverse and inclusive um, uh, uh, workplace uh, on climate um, in, in terms of emissions, carbon footprinting profile, but also what um, goals the companies have set to show that they're committed to to making um, progress. But the world's a crazy place and there's a lot of data out there. I just read this morning that something like two thirds or 80% of by market value of the S&P 500 has some sort of emissions reductions targets. Yet a small fraction of those are aligned with the Paris Climate Accord. So again, you can, you know, you can give yourself lots of stickers but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're really making progress. And so that's what we have to show our investors is not just um, that we can put up competitive returns, but also that there is an ESG attribute and characteristic um, of the portfolio that's different from the market. And one thing that we spend a lot of time on is engaging companies to push for best practices. And so we, as a firm, Newberger Berman reports out, we have something called the NB Early Votes Initiatives, where we disclose how we're gonna vote on, um, on companies' boards, uh, on compensation uh, in advance of the annual meetings so that other investors can see um, what we're um, planning on. Um, do, you, do you vote against management? We have. And what's that like when you have to uh, vote against the managements in your portfolio? Well, in that case, we say we're clearly we're supportive of what you're doing, but we're upset that uh, in, you know, in one particular case, their, um, their targets we thought were way too easy and it was a retention, not incentive comp. Um, or that had so many mechanisms for adjustment that you lose all credibility. And that's in no one's interest to lose credibility in the marketplace. And this one company, actually, we weren't the only shareholders who voted like this. And um, you know, all these votes are advisory. So it means if you vote down a comp plan, they're still getting paid. Um, but it's really bad reputation to have your image tarnished to say your shareholders think you're not being paid appropriately. Uh, and recently we engaged a whole crew um, from one of these companies, um, including one of the board members. And it's one of the best engagements that I think we had uh, because A, they were coming from a perspective of being a little bit on the defense, but also uh, being open-minded about changes that they could make that would be deemed credible in the marketplace. Because the last thing that they wanted to do is engage shareholders and then find out that uh, the changes they've made wouldn't be viewed uh, credible. So that was um, one of the more exciting engagements and tying it back to your question, what do investors expect? They expect um, 
credible returns. They, respect a, they expect a process that is thoughtfully integrating this. And many are expecting you to take a voice and to try to drive for a positive change that is associated with long-term business outcomes. Are they looking at Newberger Berman's DEI and Newberger Berman's ESG? Are yes, you? There, there was some stat that I heard recently that I want to say it was it was definitely greater than 50% of RFPs coming in. Um, uh, ask not just about our process, but about Newberger Berman and our own um, our own practices. And um, our, our CEO, George Walker, has been um, very vocal on uh, diversity and inclusion in the financial services industry, speaking from as an insider, um, uh, we are woefully underrepresented um, in, uh, in the industry. And so this is an opportunity for companies that have real commitment um, to, to make a difference. You know, one of the challenges if I've been at the firm 25 years is when you, when you have a business that retains people, it's hard to have a large shifts in, in the mix of people. But at the same time, that makes the challenge and the, and the mandate all that much more important to be very specific in, in, in trying to, to move the needle. Uh, so Ingrid, uh, going back to Larry's question, right, about if you're, um, if you're engaging with a, a big uh, pension fund, right, and, and you said that, you know, the first thing they want to see is competitive returns, and then the next question would be around what is going on with ESG or DEI or, you know, uh, uh, some of these important issues. The, what happens if, if you hold, or is there any conversation which says this may not be a competitive return in the next two years because the company is actually doing X, Y, and Z, right? Because given that you know more about the company, you may have a sense of, okay, the next two years, they may be increasing costs because they are changing something in their, uh, in their business model. But in the long term, this is going to be a, a great buy. Do these conversations happen? Are they entertained? Or am I just a pipe in the dream? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think companies are very reticent to link um, changes in business practices to increase cost unless it's regulatory driven um, and or a result of some kind of legal legal issue. So I haven't um, heard of a company um, explicitly uh, reference um, our profitability is dampened because we're doing something that now in some cases it might be, but they're sure as heck not saying that externally. Um, so, I, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find companies that would be willing to admit that. Um, and, and many of these things, um, certainly on uh, the topic of climate, I'm sure there's very explicit examples, uh, especially when you look at like chemical replacements or right. there's a lot of carcinogenic um, uh, chemicals related to flame retardants. And um, there's uh, a lot of work trying to uh, figure out alternative flame retardants and it's costly and, and, and slow. So there are very like little niche things that I'm aware of, um, but in terms of, um, you know, large scale changes in how you hire people. How, how come that has to be costly? Doesn't have to be costly. Um, it, it's just a change in the way of thinking uh, and change in product design to have, let's say more environmentally friendly attributes. It doesn't have to be costly. So much of this, uh, much of these changes in, in, in business practices, I think are more related to change in thinking and practices as opposed to adding inordinate uh, cost to the structure. Gwen, uh, before I get Gwen in here, just one last question. I taught a class last night um, in, in a law school and I made clear to my students that Delaware law where 85 or 90% of the companies are incorporated make 
shareholder welfare, the sole, and I'm going to amend that in a second, the sole consideration for management, um, saying that they can do other things and other interests can be taken into consideration, but only as an adjunct to shareholder welfare. Is there evidence that participating in ESG forms of investing are competitive with or better than non-ESG investing? Is there evidence of that? Yes. I know Sonali has done some research in this topic, but yes, there's evidence. Um, and then the second point is this notion of fiduciary, of being a steward of financial capital. Um, the next question is, how do you know you're a fiduciary? How do you know the quality of earning streams? How do you know the growth opportunity if you haven't thought about impacts to climate? You haven't thought about um, hiring practices. Uh, so that I would flip it to say that if that's your sole um, objective is financial returns and you haven't asked the um, the infrastructure be questions around the infrastructure and the reliability of those financial returns, then you're not a fiduciary and you're um, and you may not get your um, optimal um, shareholder value creation. And over what period of time are we measuring? If after five years there's, there's evidence or no evidence, is that enough of a period of time to make a judgment? In the eyes of the beholder, Larry, <laughs> some investors are looking at the day or the quarter, uh, but I certainly think over, through market cycles would be arguably um, the best uh, best measurement. But Sonali, do you have a perspective? Yeah. On so the the our research when we looked specifically at executive um, ESG linked compensation, Larry, we did find uh, that if the executive compensation is linked to ESG. Uh, the firms which did that did have higher operating profit margins going forward. And, and it's interesting, we did not find it in valuation. So it's not just firm valuation which went up. That we did not find the results on. But we found it specifically on operating profit margins. So it's more real. Uh, there's something real going on. I think cost of capital does reduce. That's the Thank sense you. we get. Gwen, you have questions from our audience. We have quite a few questions from our audience. Uh, there's a lot of interest in Newberger Berman, so I'll start with that. And so this is for Ingrid. Would you consider your ESG assets under management to be diversified across the continents of the world? And there's a, a related question. Are you restricted by corporate policy or are you restricted uh, by viable opportunities? Um, that's a good question. So yes, Newberger Berman has... Um, investments um, across the, the world. I have colleagues that invest in emerging markets that are based overseas. Um, uh, so there is a, a wide reach to the, to the footprint of investors that we represent and a wide range of, of kinds of companies um, that we invest in. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of opportunity, um, the it really depends on what your, your threshold is. So we're, we, we operate in the real world. If uh, we were to say we are only going to build a portfolio of companies with ec certain criteria, we might not find very many companies because the reason why we have sustainability challenges is that our economy is not yet sustainable. So it's, uh, it might be unrealistic to set expectations of um on, on corporations that the reality is. So there is a, there is a component to your um, question that we are restricted uh, by uh, the reality of where we invest. And then um, the, as the question uh, relates to um, opportunity, uh, it is a, it, these are really interesting times in equity markets. We, you know, over 10 years of an equity market um, bull run with valuations um, in many parts of the market is being extremely high. And so there can be companies that sound and have um, good ideas, but we uh, take pause in being able to allocate capital there uh, just from a risk reward or from a financial perspective. So there, there, are, there are companies that um, are interesting, but that from a valuation perspective, 
um, we're, we're not invested in. Uh, so I think the answer is kind of yes to all of that. We're, we're, we invest everywhere. Um, we're restricted by the reality of the, the backdrop we invest in. And you can have a good idea, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good investment. All right, thank you. And here's here's one that's a little more general, uh, and maybe Sonali could handle this one. Is the capitalist model of economic growth and consumption fundamentally incompatible with environmental sustainability? No, the answer to that is no. Uh, it is compatible, and it goes back to uh, what Ingrid talked about: is uh, if you're taking a long-term view of shareholder capitalism or long-term view of value to the shareholder, then uh, then absolutely having uh, ESG related issues uh, that the firm deals with or works with. So that includes, um, you know, retaining the right talent, uh, having diversity initiatives so that you, you get the best talent across uh, all, all, uh, all kinds of talent uh, um, pool of talent or employees, um, taking care of climate risk, looking after your customers, um, uh, even about local communities, all of that will lead to long-term shareholder value. So it's it's important, and you know, finance talks about this a lot, and our students do short-term valuation versus a long-term view. And so, if you take the long-term view, it's not incompatible. Yeah. The other thing I would add, Gwen, is that um, one of the challenges um, is that many of these um, topics that we're talking about. Um, might be externalized cost. And so as you bring a price to carbon, as you bring a price to not being inclusive, um, then even more so the capital markets can help figure out the winners um, um, from the losers. And that one of the challenges that we've had historically is that um, energy use and clean water and respect for human rights, these are all things that reside outside of the income statement and, and, and the balance sheet. But increasingly, given the constraints that our world lives in, um, are in some cases finding a price, so to speak. All right, uh, this one is from a Baruch undergraduate. Uh, it's a little different from the conversation so far, but I think it's a very interesting aspect, potential aspect of this discussion. Are there any cryptocurrencies or blockchain technology stocks that could be potentially part of new, the Neuberger Berman uh, ESG portfolios? Not that we found. I just heard on this morning, uh, NPR was had a, um, there's this debate now going on in the Finger Lakes because some um, crypto um, currency plant um, is applying for air pollution uh, rights uh, for manufacturing. There's a lot of um, community pushback. So um, one of the challenges is any energy intensive business has uh, negative externalities. And until we can get a higher degree of renewable energy in our distribution, um, any business, whether it's cryptocurrency or intense um, energy consumption business will uh, certainly um, be challenged. But I do think the future is bright for uh, renewables um, and um, that uh, hopefully in a decade from now, um, energy intensive businesses uh, won't be quote, disadvantaged in the eyes of uh, uh, environmentalists, because if you're using uh, renewable uh, resources, uh, your, your footprint will be dramatically different. I would also expect that $80 oil and soaring natural gas prices would accelerate the use of uh, uh, replaceable energy. At least I think that's true. Yeah, it certainly drives energy efficiency. <laughs> um, I would hope. On a sweater, right? <laughs> I would hope. All righty. Uh, this is a question for Ingrid. Uh, as an active portfolio manager of ESG-oriented investment funds, you compete against lower-cost ESG funds that are advertised as index funds. Could you comment on the potential value of active management relative to index fund competition in the ESG space? Yeah. My, my short answer is that... Uh, sustainability is not a passive option. And that in order to identify and invest in 
um, best in class businesses, you have to make an active choice. And by being a universal owner of the market with some uh, tilt to it, uh, in my view, but I'm highly biased, uh, given what I do, um, is that's that's not sustainability. Do you find that your portfolio changes from time to time, not based on investment um, uh, opportunities, but based on changes in what companies are doing, so that certain companies now can be included and certain companies can be excluded? I I think you're I I, I absolutely think that the the changing notion of what it means to be sustainable is, is very fluid and that um, there's enormous opportunities for companies to do things differently within a particular industry. Uh, in general, I think the, the definition of what not to own has gotten, <laughs> has gotten, has gotten larger. Um, as opposed, but at the same time, there are more and more um, companies trying to do um, interesting new things. So, but it, yeah, the, the expectations on corporate America um, are the changing expectations on corporate America, it's, it's not slowing down. And so I do think, um, again, this concept of an awakening that companies who couldn't even spell ESG now are hiring people to help them figure out <laughs> um, how to utilize it to improve their business. All right, thank you. Sonali, as the Executive Director for Undergraduate Programs in the Zicklin School, you are in direct contact with many of our undergraduates. As a generation, they are known to be very concerned about issues of climate diversity and such. Do you, feel, do you feel they have a good grasp on how they can express their concerns to businesses that they work for and to businesses that they invest in? And how will their business education in the Zicklin School support them in these regards? I think we, uh, uh, we've, and the Zygmunt School of Business, we have changed our curriculum quite a bit uh, as we've evolved. So in even our basic fundamental classes, whether it's a basic accounting class or a basic finance class, we are bringing in a lot of these nuances related to ESG, either uh, through conversations or through cases. So I think the students are a lot more aware about what businesses could do to change the needle. They're also a lot more aware about what are the disclosure requirements that companies need to show. Because, you know, companies, uh, I mean, something about, uh, Inga talked about finding the price, right? So there are external costs, but that's linked to what is the company actually telling you they are doing versus what they're actually doing. And so to be able to differentiate that, we need more of the undergrads, more of the people working in these companies to push and say, disclose more, tell us more. Give, uh, and, and disclosure is something that uh, I think our students can push for more with the companies they work for. And when they're investing, read a lot more. So read, uh, as, as Ingrid talked about, read the, the statements. Uh, if, if you've got your investing in active funds, then read what, what are they investing in? What are the criteria for screening, for filtering? That's kind of how. And I think our students are prepared to do that. All right, we have uh, just time for one last question. And Larry, I'd like to ask you, um, underlying today's discussion is the idea that while some corporate actions that support ESG may not be uh, in the short-term interest of the shareholders, but they can't be ignored in the longer term. After this session with Sonali and Ingrid, do you feel more optimistic or, or maybe less optimistic about the potential con contributions of business in achieving the ESG goals? Well, there's no question in my mind that business is going to be heavily um, weighted in ESG goals. There's just no question. And one of the reasons they're going to be so deeply involved in this is the fear of it being discovered that they're not involved in it. And that has all kinds of portfolio, uh, all kinds of business risks that they don't want to undertake. But I want to echo something that Ingrid said. Since I'm old and a little bit cynical because of age, I want to get through a market cycle to understand this better. And we said we're in this long bull market, probably dates from 2010 or something like that. We're in a 40-year bull market in bonds. I don't think we yet have an understanding of what's going to happen in the future. So I want to get through this cycle before I make a final judgment. 
but there's no question um, ESG is here to stay. I agree with it completely. Uh, and it should be, by the way. All right. Uh, we are out of time. I want to thank you, Larry. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Sonali, for a, a great discussion. I want to thank many in the audience who submitted questions. And there, we just ran, have run out of time. Uh, I see Matt has put in chat um, a, a notice of our next webinar. It's on November 9th. It's on Facebook. Uh, the title will be Facebook Addiction by Design. Uh, it's going to be very topical, and our guest joining Larry will be Professor Yafit Lev Aretz from our law department. Um, I want to thank you, Ingrid, Larry, and Sonali for a great discussion. Uh, I think everyone uh, would agree with me that we could have gone on many, many, many more hours or minutes uh, on this topic. So thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>